F-117 stealth aircraft have also crossed the border unescorted and head for Baghdad. Time for some war crimes, am I right? It's on Desert Storm. Day one. Time that I react to other stuff. Okay, look, I haven't, I haven't forgotten. Okay. Seven B fifty two. I have all the suggestions there, but I want to go react to like other channels. When they return, I can't just react to like one, like one view set of channels. Like, no, no. A war will have started, and they will have set a new record for the longest bombing raid in history. A year prior, in nineteen ninety. High levels of oil production in the state of Kuwait and other Arab nations are depressing global oil prices. Because of its economic dependency on oil revenue, neighboring Iraq is struggling to pay $14 billion debts on loans used to finance its war with Iran in the 1980s. It has come to the point where Iraq is now even struggling to pay for basic government spending. Dating from the fall of the Ottoman Empire after World War I, Iraq has maintained sovereign claims over Kuwait. An accusation that Kuwait is slant drilling Iraqi oil fields gives Iraqi President Saddam Hussein an excuse to invade and annex the small nation on the 2nd of August 1990. You know, there was. There may have been. There may have been a bit of truth to that. I haven't done too much research into this. There may have been some truth to that. The whole uh, fiasco of Desert Storm is interesting per se. Saddam Hussein was by no means a good person, but um, some of his claims kind of had merit to them. Following international condemnation and sanctions, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and US President George H.W. Bush begin to deploy forces to Saudi Arabia, urging other countries to do the same. Britain, America's vassal, it is so pathetic, honestly speaking, seeing how Britain has gone so low, went from being a hyperpower to being America's little vassal, the downfall, ugh. This is such a shame. Wherever America goes, Britain is always there. A UN Shaking my head. Giving Iraq a deadline of the 15th of January 1991 to completely withdraw from Kuwait. <laughs> the build-up of coalition forces in Saudi Arabia is called Operation Desert Shield. Over a period of six months, 35 nations send a total of approximately 1 million military personnel to Saudi Arabia the largest military alliance since World War II. 2,230 coalition aircraft are sent to bases in Saudi Arabia, and six carrier battle groups are deployed in the region. The that is so mad, is bro. An air war to achieve dominance of the skies above Iraq, and to strike targets to degrade the Iraqi military for when the ground invasion is launched some weeks later. Ah... <laughs> Don't you just love American imperialism? I do too. <laughs> Although Kuwait, you see Kuwait, you know what? We're two minutes into the video. I'm not even going to talk yet. The first day of the air assault. I'm not even going to say nothing yet. I won't. Iraq has a very dangerous arsenal of air defense systems. 154 SAM sites with 16,000 missiles defend Iraq, alongside a further 972 anti-aircraft artillery guns. 2,404 fixed AA guns and 6,100 mobile AA guns. Baghdad is likely the most heavily defended city in the But how good are they at aiming? World. 478 early warning radars watch the skies for coalition aircraft, with command and control centers ready to scramble the Iraqi Air Force's 550 combat aircraft to respond. Mm, that's quite sizable. Priority for day one of the air campaign will be to degrade the enemy's air defense systems. The deadline passes, and a day later the great air assault on Iraq is put into motion. Eight Bro. Hours the start of the air war. 
Nah, bro. Imagine like Iran. I wonder what Iran thought about this. We literally like ten years ago, like a decade ago at this point, the Iran Iraq war had happened. <laughs> and like the like the whole world supported Iraq. <laughs> But then, when America realized that, oh, Iraq is, um, Iraq is not going to be serving my interest anymore, <laughs> they turn on Iraq. At 2.38am on the 17th of January, two hours before H-hour, the B-52s are nearing the end of their long journey from Louisiana, and an enormous armada of aircraft is taking off all over Saudi Arabia, <laughs> and from carriers in the Red Sea and the Arabian Gulf. Don't you just love all of that U.S. tax paying dollars? Two flights of helicopters in those B fifty, whatever the heck he said, helicopter and four Apache attack helicopters cross the border at low level. Their call sign is Task Force Normandy. Their job is to sneak up on and shoot up two key enemy radar positions. This will cut a vital gap in the radar coverage through which the coalition strike aircraft can stream into Iraq to hit their targets. E-2 and E-3 airborne warning and control aircraft, referred to as AWACS, are orbiting near the border, directing operations and keeping an eye on Iraqi airspace. Air-to-air -air refueling tankers are now refueling the aircraft of the enormous first striking force over Saudi Arabia. For the last few months, large formations of coalition aircraft have massed every night near the border, so as not to cause a specific alarm in the enemy command structure when the air war does start. What Iraqi radars can't see tonight is the further formations of aircraft massing further away from the border at low level. F-117 stealth aircraft have also crossed the border unescorted and head for Baghdad. Time for some war crimes, am I right? It's unclear whether their stealth <laughs> will be potent enough to cloak them from the massive fire control radars around the heavily defended city. They are to hit key communications infrastructure in the city, hindering central military commander's ability to coordinate their air defence sites around the country. One of the main targets is the International Communications Centre in central Baghdad, through which 50% of all military comms traffic is routed. Why? What was Iraq thinking? What was, seriously, what was Iraq thinking? Putting something like that important through, like, in the middle of Baghdad. What, what was, <laughs> oh my, that is such a bad move. These vital strikes should have just put that in, like, the middle of a desert or something, I don't know. ...are needed to protect the main assault aircraft when they attack in the coming hours. In the end, the stealth bombers circle Baghdad undetected, waiting for H-hour. A few minutes before H-hour, the US Air Force fires the first shots of the war, launching 35 AGM-86 cruise missiles from the Barksdale B-52s at communications sites and power plants. Simultaneously, coalition naval battle groups begin launching Tomahawk cruise missiles at mainly communications targets in Baghdad. Two of the ships launching Tomahawks the USS Missouri and Wisconsin are battleships that first saw service in World War II and will serve their country once more. The Bro, uh, this guy is British. Uh, this guy is this guy is British. I can tell. Um, dude, I don't. I don't want to say that he's like doing a narrative but like that's the vibe that i'm getting right now honestly like i i bro i like serve their country once more like i mean serving u.s imperial i mean it's just cringe honestly i don't know what else i mean i just cringed yeah i just cringed it's just cringe dude because, like, if you actually think America really cares about giving other people's countries freedom, um, yeah, you need to go and uh, check on that again. Because so, it don't. What America cares about, simply speaking, is, um, you know what? 
I'm, I'm not gonna say that yet. Uh, we're only like six minutes in the video. Tomahawks will navigate to their targets using an onboard system that identifies and follows known landmarks and terrain contours on the route to the target. Because much of the direct route to Baghdad from the Persian Gulf is flat desert, the cruise missiles must follow a longer easterly route over more hilly, trackable terrain near the Iranian border. The missiles fly at subsonic speed, so while these are the first shots to be fired, the US Army would have the honor of the first shots to explode. This, this is what I'm talking about. The honor of having the first shots explode. It's like, it's like he's like me writing the, the, the US. Come on, it's 2024. Like, I get that, like, you're covering the Iraq war. Cool. But, like, come on, man. At least just be objective with it, man. Don't do that whole, uh, honor of having the first shots. Like, like come on, bro. That's so cringy, the dude. Two of Apaches arrive near two radar sites 30 seconds early and come to hover in lines of four abreast. I actually watched this. I actually watched... Uh, when I was looking at some Iraq war stuff in the past, I actually, like, watched the footage of this. You can go find it. Precisely 2.38 a.m. They watch the compound through their infrared cameras. At first, it appears that the Iraqis are oblivious to their presence. But with 10 seconds to go, the compound's lights go out, and figures are observed running around outside. At 2.38 a.m., H hour, Desert Storm begins. The Apaches unleash a furious rain of destruction on the radar installations. Hellfire missiles are first aimed at power generators. Further Hellfires and 70mm rockets are fired on radar dishes, command vehicles and communications antennas as the attack helicopters move in closer. They expend everything they have on the site. Such is the importance to knock out the radar, the Apache crews then move in closer still and engage whatever is left standing with 30mm cannon. <laughs> Jeez, man. Attack when an ammunition dump is hit by cannon fire. During the four minutes of oh, overkill, man. Jeez. Destruction. Twenty-seven hellfires, one hundred rockets, and four thousand cannon rounds have been unleashed on the sites. The crews report in total destruction of the two sites for no loss. They turn back to the border. The first aircraft of the first strike wave screams overhead. The air war is underway. Three EF-111 radar jamming aircraft rush towards Baghdad to provide jamming support for the F-117s in case they are detected. With coalition aircraft streaming into Iraq, it's crucial that the stealth bombers knock out comms infrastructure. So I'm looking for individual- To maintain stealth, the F-117s are unable to use their radios to report on progress. Commanders at the Coalition Tactical Air Control Center, the TAC, won't know if the crucial task has been successfully completed until the aircraft are near the Saudi border on their return journey. The strike aircraft will be deep inside Iraq by then. But this is the first major war to take place during the new age of communications and international live television. Believing the imminent start of the new conflict after the UN deadline passing, live news channels have sent reporters into Baghdad. At the TAC, they spot that a reporter is live on CNN, reporting hearing aircraft over the city. The news streams almost definitely route through the International Communications Center, and mm -hmm. the F-117s. Yeah. CNN is put up on the large screens in the TAC. At 0300, the precise moment the first bomb should be falling on target, CNN lose the live feed from their reporter on the ground. A cheer erupts at the TAC. The first F-117 strikes stir the hornet's nest, and 2,000 anti-aircraft guns in Baghdad open fire into the night sky. Stealth can protect the aircraft from radar-guided missiles, but blindly fired anti-aircraft fire in such volume will be equally deadly if a lucky direct hit is scored. Yep. They drop 17 paveway guided bombs on 13 targets, radio towers, command bunkers, and a palace just outside the city incorrectly believed to have been housing Saddam Hussein himself. Shortly after, the first of 116 Navy launched Tomahawks begin to fall on Baghdad, hitting party headquarters, a Scud ballistic missile factory, another presidential palace, 
and other targets of importance. A British journalist watches from his Baghdad hotel window as a tomahawk screams past him at eye level down the street and hits the Ministry of Defence building at the end of it. Some tomahawks carry special warheads which contain long strips of carbon filament. These missiles fly over power transformers and switching stations and release these strips into them, causing the electrical components to spark, short out and burst into flames. Five electrical facilities are hit. The B-52 launched cruise missiles fall on further communication sites and power generation facilities, including the So far, so far, no big evidence of war crimes. But in my personal opinion, I do believe the um, Iraq War, both first and second Iraq War, was unjustified. The first one. Kuwait was just a convenient excuse. The second one, the, 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 come on, weapons of mass destruction, really? Like. The Al Musayib Thanal power plant. After a grueling flight across the Atlantic and Mediterranean to get here, the B 52s will now fly back to Louisiana without landing. The 14,000 mile mission takes 35 hours, requiring 57 tanker sorties. A demonstration of American global reach. With a, uh -huh. a demonstration of American global reach. A demonstration, bro. You, you're literally British, bro. Like, why do you sound so proud? <laughs> why, dude? He sounds so proud. <laughs> Do you hear the way how he talks? He sounds so proud. Come on. Why are you proud of the very country that ripped apart the British Empire? <laughs> We're allies. <laughs> that is the biggest lie ever. <laughs> yeah, allies. <laughs> Rocky Khan and Control seriously degraded. The 600 oh, that's amazing. Wave of strike aircraft with fighter escort begin hitting military targets across Iraq. SAM sites, Scud missile sites, command and control bunkers and airfields. RAF Tornado and US Navy F-14 interceptor aircraft patrol the Iraqi border and orbit Iraqi Air Force bases waiting for the enemy fighters to come out to fight. One formation, a strike package of F-15E Strike Eagles escorted by F-15C fighters and an EF-111 radar jamming aircraft hit Scud missile launch sites in the western desert, attempting to prevent Scud launches against nearby Israel. With the alarm now raised, the Iraqi Air Force is in the air defending their nation, setting up combat air patrols near key installations. With the strikes against the launches underway, an F-15 detects a single Iraqi Mirage fighter nearby and destroys it with a Sparrow missile. Another Mirage moves in close behind the low-flying EF-111 and fires a missile. The 111 makes a violent turn and evades. At this point, an F-15 above spots the hostile aircraft and dives in to engage. Spotting the attacking Eagle, the Mirage itself makes a violent maneuver to evade the American fighter, but in doing so crashes into the ground. The unarmed EF-111 pilot is credited with a maneuvering kill. Another F-15C Eagle has just crossed the border into a Ah, yes. The Iraqi Air Force, top tier in the world. Hilarious how um, Iraq had the whole world support during the Iran-Iraq war, and they still did horrible. Iraq, and the pilot detects a distant, unidentified contact on his radar. Rules of engagement require the pilot to ask one of the E-3 command and control aircraft for permission to fire. The contact begins to maneuver aggressively, and the E-3 grants permission to fire. The long-range Sparrow missile flies into the distance, and the pilot sees the fireball as it detonates. The enemy aircraft downed is a modern and dangerous MiG-29 Fulcrum, piloted by a veteran of the Iran-Iraq War with three kills on his record. Mm, wow. Mm, scary. Weasel aircraft are some of the many... 
and that's the thing about modern warfare well modern air warfare modern air warfare is um it's kind of boring it's it's really boring now it's just haha look at me i go launch my missiles before i even see my target there's no like dog fights or anything like that no not really aircraft on their way to baghdad to attack radar sites and sam sites because of the volume of coalition assets in the area the escorting f-15s are constantly investigating potentially hostile contacts that turn out to be friendly after a few false alarms, Captain Steve Tate finally finds an enemy mirage. He engages with a Sparrow missile, and the fireball confirms the kill. Yeah, see, this is what I'm talking about. It's like, you know, he just sees the enemy aircraft, and he doesn't even go near. He just goes and shoots a missile, and boom, that's it. Its of aircraft are inbound to Baghdad to attack salmon radar sites. Given the heavy air defenses around the city, this could be a treacherous task. The US Navy aircraft make their first major play of the night. A6 intruders to the west launch decoy glider drones towards the city, intended to trick the defending SAM sites into switching on their radars. It works, and many surface to air missiles are launched against them. The Iraqis believe that is smart. That is actually genius. I'm not gonna lie, that is actually genius. They've scored multiple kills. What they don't see are the US Navy FA-18 Hornets, armed with high-speed anti-radar missiles, HARMS, coming in behind. The HARMS lock onto the radar signals coming from the SAM sites on the ground as they engage the drones. A further 37 BQM-74 jet-powered drones approach from the south and orbit the city. Some are shot down by MiGs, but the rest are tracked and engaged by the SAM sites on the ground. The F-4s and F-A-18s move in and launch 75 harms, destroying approximately 35 installations. The idea of offering bait drone aircraft to the air defences for the wild weasels to engage is that of Brigadier General Larry Poobar Henry. The engagement during Desert Storm becomes known as Poobar's party. Another flight of four F-A-18s are approaching the large airbase H-3 in western Iraq with an E-2 Hawkeye carrier launched early warning aircraft above. A pair of MiG-29s move to engage the Hornets, but F-15s dive in and easily add two more kills uh, to an impressive uh, and growing tally. How is this impressive? This is over overkill is what it is. This is not being impressive with this at all. I, oh my gosh, dude. Oh my gosh. American imperialism. So, so great. Am I right? With 30 miles to go, the E-2 calls out two elderly MiG-21s aggressively attacking head-on. The Hornets are impressive multi-role aircraft. Lieutenant Commander Fox switches from ground attack to air-to-air -to -air mode with the flick of a switch. He locks onto one MiG, while his wingman locks onto the other. Fox fires a Sidewinder missile, and his wingman fires a Sparrow. Both hit. Both pilots calmly switch their aircraft back to ground attack mode, and almost without breaking step complete their bombing raid on the airfield. A powerful demonstration of the efficiency of multi-role aircraft in modern warfare. Further B-50 Yeah, but the, the, the year fighting, um... All the aircraft, the, these aircraft the, that the Iraqis were using were Soviet aircraft. Um, nothing else crazy about them. The real question is, what would happen when uh, America actually meets a country that is its match? Like China. China is going to be the real test. Okay, China's going to be the real test. I wouldn't say Russia. Uh, Russia still has a long ways to go. But China's going to be the real test. 52s and F-111s drop conventional bombs on the elite Iraqi army corps, the Republican Guard, to soften them up and as a show of the military power that they're up against. It's claimed that fear of the B-52s conventional bombing capability caused mass Iraqi surrenders later on in the war. A B-52 is hit by a US missile in a friendly fire incident and crashes on the way home. 
The air assault is going nearly perfectly at this point, but the TAC planners know that statistically their luck must change. And it does. A squadron of FA-18s from the USS Saratoga, known as the Sunliners, are on their way to take part in Pooh Bar's party, when the leader detects a MiG-25 interceptor in front of them. He requests permission from the AWACS to engage, but the AWACS radar can't find the bandit, and so permission is denied. There are hundreds of coalition aircraft in the air, so rules of engagement are tight to reduce friendly fire. The MiG slips away, but later shoots down another Hornet in the squadron, killing Lieutenant Commander Michael Speicher. Wow. Dawn breaks wow. Like the only Iraqi air victory. <laughs> wow. Desert, and further waves move in. The British tornadoes have perhaps the most dangerous job of the first 24 hours. 12 aircraft scream over the British. The Br it, it is a shame to me to see the British helping the Americans with their imperialistic ambitions. It, it's such a shame to me. Such a spit in the face. How dare you? I mean, that's what I think anyways. How dare you help America after what they did to you? <laughs> Shaking my head. Over the desert at just 200 feet towards Talil Air Base. The RAF's two-seater TPR-1 is a specialist in runway busting. In the first day of a hypothetical hot war with the Soviet Union, Tornadoes would maraud over the border into Eastern Europe to neutralize enemy airfields. Today they carry their specialist weapon, the JP-233, a system that drops a combination of 30 runway cratering bomblets on the runway, and 215 anti-personnel mines to hinder the repair process after. Anti-aircraft fire is much heavier than expected, as they line up on the two parallel runways at 180 feet. Pushing through the barrage, each aircraft releases its two JP-233 dispensers. The runways are shredded, and the anti-personnel mines are scattered across both runways and across the airfield, waiting to punish any repair workers who attempt to make the runways operational again. All aircraft make it out, but the crew report that the flak was heavier than forecast, and that they were in fact very lucky to make it back undamaged. A short time later, in the southeast of Iraq, Another wing of four tornadoes approach our Ramallah airbase at low level, each this time with eight conventional 1,000 pound bombs. Just before the target, the aircraft will pull up into a climb and release their bombs, thereby throwing the bombs in an arc at the target. The downward momentum when they hit allows the bombs to penetrate into the ground before exploding, maximizing damage. Because the bombs are released at range, a target computer calculates the precise release moments during the climb. Flight Lieutenants John Peters, the pilot, and John Nicol, the navigator, begin their attack run. Ferocious flak opens up on them, and their aircraft is physically buffeted by the nearby explosions. They begin their climb. There's a problem. They have some kind of fault in their targeting computer, and it's not releasing their bombs. They continue to climb as they try to quickly rectify the problem. They're now almost twice the height they should be, and very vulnerable. Peters aborts and rolls the aircraft nearly upside down to bank and dive away. Descending and accelerating, they make for safety, but just after they level out, they're hit by a shoulder-launched SAM. Both men eject, but are captured by the Iraqis, suffering severe maltreatment. The airstrikes continue without rest throughout the day, against military and communications installations across the country. I mean, when your country is literally getting bombed to oblivion, and this that's the thing with America, America just really has this obsession of just bombing everyone to oblivion, like, and that they go so far with it, it's kind of disgusting to me, I mean, should, should you treat them like that? No, you shouldn't. You should probably treat them with care, but when they're bombing the living heck out of your country, are you actually going to want to feel remorse to these people? Like, no. 
By day, A-10 warthogs hit radar sites along the Iraqi border, similar to those that the Apaches had hit during the night. U-2 spy planes overfly Iraq to search for mobile scud launchers. Special Operations helicopters loiter near Baghdad to pick up downed aircrew. Further coalition aircraft join the strikes from bases in Turkey. Twelve French Jaguars attack the Scud missile facility at the Ahmed Al Jaber Air Base in Kuwait, and four take heavy damage from flak. The coalition takes some further losses throughout the day, mostly from anti aircraft fire on low level missions. In the evening, four elderly A 6 intruders are the latest to approach Airbase H 3 with laser guided bombs. They split into two pairs and attack from different directions at low level. One aircraft is hit by a SAM, the crew eject and are later captured. Another aircraft is hit, but makes it to Saudi Arabia. Over the first 24 hours of the air war, 2,775 sorties are conducted against strategic Iraqi targets. 2,000 bro. 2 freaking thousand bro. 2000 Bro, what? That uh, Dude, America just uh, All that tax money Tax paying dollars <laughs> Crazy, right? Crazy! Instead of You know, the government invest that money into education into stuff that people actually need. No, 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 no. No, your tax paying dollars and mine, because I live in America, is going to this. 2000 sorties. Oh, because of um imperialistic American interest. Ah, uh, yes, to keep the top 1%, below 1% capitalist oligarchs in power. <laughs> Well, your average American citizen, along with me, we suffer. We suffer. Because we barely get anything back from our government. Barely scraping by. Crazy, right? The Iraqi Air Force flies just 120 sorties. Best country in the world, though. Aircraft. Some of the Iraqi jets flee to their recent enemy, Iran. 19 coalition aircraft the irony of that. damaged in day one. The irony of that. Saddam Hussein declares that the mother of all battles has begun. The air assault continues for five weeks, pounding the Iraqi military at a rate of 2,500 bombing sorties per day. Mm -mm -mm. Dude, I swear, I get so angry whenever I hear this because... I really believe that the U.S. should cut its military spending, although it's it's not going to do that. Let's be real. Uh, there's so much better sectors that America can uh, invest in, domestically speaking. Um, so whenever I hear this, I, it, 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 it infuriates the living heck out of me, bro. Largely. The Iraqi Air Force, the fourth largest air force in the world, doesn't come out in full force to fight, and therefore the dangerous low-level attacks on airfields are reduced in favor of hitting mobile scud launchers. I'm shocked. How the Iraq Air Force didn't come out? Nine coalition air I wonder why. Lost in combat during the air campaign, with another 36 lost in accidents. Gradually, attacks are shifted towards degrading the Iraqi military itself. The ground invasion of Iraq to liberate Kuwait will begin on the 24th of February. Yeah, the liberate Kuwait, guys. Yeah, go take that face value. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, liberate Kuwait. Yeah, sure. And there, there was nothing like... No ulterior motives whatsoever. Look, man, go, go check out my other reactions if you like what I have to say on my videos. Um, <laughs> go subscribe after that. If you have any suggestions, just go comment it down below for me. Um... No, I just like the video, so many videos still on the YouTube algorithm. Thank you for watching and goodbye.